Chapter 18 Into the Dragon's Den Vanity All was vanity. Nora made one last glance toward her reflection in the slender, full-length mirror. She couldn't help but feel a little silly for taking so long getting dressed. After all, she wasn't going far, and she was only going to be seeing the troublesome dragon. Nora quickly reminded herself to keep on task. Even still, she couldn't help but glance over her shoulder. The woman in the mirror quirked her brow, giving her a pointed look of disapproval. Nora turned. I know it's tacky. That's the point, she snapped at her reflection and then groaned. While her green, loose-fitting trousers were warm, they poofed over her black riding boots, and her large green tunic went all the way down past her knees. Well, technically, it was Vila's shirt, but that's what he got for going without her. Nora stepped back and let out a frazzled sigh. She felt like a big green bush. Still, she had a bloody good reason. If she had anything sparkly on, any glint of metal or jewelry or abnormal garments and bright colors, the dragon might be distracted. Dragons were a lot like ravens. They were entitled little thieves that stole everything and anything that wasn't nailed down. She let out another disgruntled sigh while adding a simple black leather belt which kept her long tunic from looking like a bush. Now she felt more like a rumpled evergreen. With one last quick shimmy, she turned away from the mirror. This would have to do until she could go shopping. In her hurry to leave, she had left so many things back in Glendon, but she was too proud and too bitter to send a letter to ask for her things back. Ready to go, she grabbed her mage's staff. The staff was made out of carved maple that was stained with a dark maroon color. While the staff looked mysterious, it didn't have any powers. Staves and wands merely acted as tools of leverage and focus, much like a shepherd's rod or sling. Other mages preferred wands as they were typically more portable, but when it came to dealing with dragons, Nora preferred to have as much leverage as she could possibly get. A white, frosty cloud of mist puffed and puffed from her lips as she waded through the snow until finally she reached the small side door. Nora muttered under her breath as she was about to lift the brass door knocker. Son of Maltine! Why am I knocking on my own bloody house? She scolded herself. It was already bad enough to have to enter through the servants' quarters, but the last thing she wanted was the dragon getting loose until she knew how big of a problem dragon she was dealing with first. However, when she attempted to open the door, she found it was frozen shut. Being an elemental mage, this was not a problem for her. The only difficult part was finding heat in the already cold climate. Any self-made witch could light a candle flame, but when it came to anything larger, she had to draw the heat from someplace else. A little body heat to ignite a candle wick was nothing. Unthawing a frozen door? Well, that was a little more complicated. If she used her own body heat, she would likely succeed, and then shortly die from hyperthermia. Instead, Nora set the end of her staff onto the door and channeled the heat from the ambient air around her and funneled it through the shaft. 
Ice crystals formed on the short, twisted roots on the heavy top end, and hot plumes of steam billowed out at the bottom. With a little bit of pressure, the door gently gave away. Nora cautiously peered into the abandoned kitchen and smiled as she tapped the frosted top knot of her staff onto the door frame and broke away the ice shell like brittle sugar candy and neatly sidestepped over a fallen pan that still lay on the floor. Well, it seems like everything's still here, she mused out loud. She supposed there was one nice thing about having a dragon living in her house. It certainly kept the looters away. Any other abandoned building would have been stripped bare, and all the windows would have been broken. The question was, should she go up or down? If I was a dragon, where would I be, she wondered. Better question, where could I fit and where would I want to go, she corrected herself. Judging by how intact the kitchen was, she was quite sure it hadn't been able to fit through the single doors, or at least it hadn't tried hard enough yet. She couldn't help but smile. If Torin was with her, he would have insisted they check the cellar first. While Nora disapproved of his horrible drinking habit, she couldn't help but wonder what else was in the cellar. Maybe she would find some bread, or strawberry preserve, or... Nora shook her head. Stay focused, she insisted. The sooner she got her house in order, the sooner she would be sleeping in a nice, warm feather bed, and she would have servants bringing her as much strawberry preserve on piping hot, fresh toast as she wanted. She wrinkled her nose. She could already smell Vila's pickled sardines. Gross. Still, the thought of Vila coming back and seeing her in the little burnt-up shack was all the more motivation to keep herself on task. Once she made her way into the entry, she quickly spotted the sign of dragon. But even without the large scratch marks on the marble floors and the stone columns, all she had to do was look up and see the gaping hole in the large vaulted ceiling where the chandelier had been torn down from. This didn't nearly offend her as much as the obnoxious lime green colored walls. She made a mental note to repaint everything. Keeping focused, Nora readied herself in case she needed to throw up a defensive barrier. This barrier was considered to be an advanced technique, even for experienced elementals like herself. Some mages called it soul magic. The best way Nora could describe the soul barrier was that it was like a blanket of millions of tiny interlocking rings of energy that could take any form. It wasn't telekinesis. Telekinesis required someone to be aware of any incoming object with this ability, so long as she had the strength and concentration to keep it up, she could block anything, even if it came from behind her. But she had to be careful. Nothing could breach the barrier. Not even her. Nora had learned this the hard way. It felt like she had been struck by a mini bolt of lightning, and had sent her flying back a whole ten feet. Luckily for her, the moment she touched the barrier was the exact moment she lost control of it. It had not been pleasant, and she had the taste of burnt copper in her mouth for weeks, and whomever she greeted got a nasty little shock. This, of course, was while she was still a, an apprentice mage. She might have been in, in trouble if the instructors hadn't been so impressed. Instead, she was sent away to the special dormitories with the rest of the special 
apprentices, affectionately known as the Firebugs, or the Wizards. To this day, Nora had to repress the violent urges she felt when anyone ever addressed her, or even asked the instant question if she was a wizard or not. There were many other smaller, illegitimate schools in Marne. Those were wizards. Idiots that could call down lightning and set themselves on fire. Founders keep trained mages. A proper mage was a well-rounded and formally trained in all aspects of magic. Mages were learned, educated, upright individuals that pledged to use their abilities to serve their nation. Wizards went about wearing funny hats stuffed full of bizarre ideas and smelly, dirty robes and had crumbs stuck in their beards and said, Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Please let me try again. Nora pursed her lips and glanced up at the well-traveled twin staircase and turned to the broken-down double doors leading into the dining hall. She was quite confident wherever her chandelier had been taken was where she would find her dragon. Up or down? Don Ruskell always advised his novice writers against putting themselves between their dragon and a hard place. Nora smiled. Old man Don Ruskell would have chosen to search the top floors first. Dragons were extremely dangerous from above, and especially in close, confined spaces. If Nora had to get out quickly... She didn't want to be running blindly into a broom closet or trapped in a room without any windows. If the dragon came up from behind while she was upstairs, there'd always be a window she could escape through. If she did find the dragon upstairs and things went poorly, she could always go back the way she had come. This would not be possible if the dragon came down while she continued straight ahead into the dining hall. I'd better not find you in my bedroom, Nora muttered to herself. Alas, the double doors had been broken down, and the only thing left intact was... No, there was nothing intact. You little thieving troll, she gasped. While there was no dragon to be found, the bed frame had been torn apart and all the pillows and blankets had been hauled off. Most likely, he had built a, a nice little nest for himself somewhere and was curled up all warm and comfy with her chandeliers. After searching the guest rooms, she quickly found the same pattern repeated everywhere. Sometimes she wished she had been part of a canine unit or worked with horses. Stay focused, Nora told herself. It was fairly obvious that the dragon was not in the upper rooms, and she doubted it would try to squeeze itself into the attic. The attic was another place she would have to explore once she had tamed the dragon and the house finally belonged to her. Nora couldn't help but pause and straighten the picture before leaving the guest bedroom and turned to head back downstairs. It was silly, but the painting reminded her of Warren. She hoped he was well. Making her way back down the winding stairs, Nora was surprised she hadn't gotten the dragon's attention yet. She figured it was either sleeping or hiding on top of its mound of plundered sparkles. She smiled. In the legends, dragons were supposed to hoard gold and gems. But in reality, it was probably just a pile of junk. Bits of debris crunched and echoed under her boots as she entered the dining hall. You little toad, Nora murmured as she glanced up at the gaping hole in the white plaster where an even larger chandelier had been ripped down from the ceiling. 
Her sky blue eyes narrowed as she spotted the scratch marks where it had been dragged away. Judging by the hole in the ceiling, it had been enormous. It perhaps may have even been beautiful at one time. Nora leaned on her staff and thoughtfully glanced around the dance floor. She wondered if she could get Vila to dance. She hadn't been dancing in such a long time. Vila was very handsome when he was in his suit and his hair was combed. The thought made her smile, but she doubted she would get him to go dancing with her. Unless she told him they were looking for Droon spies, and she desperately needed his protection. Nora paused and held her breath. If the dragon had been sleeping, she was quite certain she would have heard its loud breathing by now. She was close, and she could sense it. Yet somehow, she knew the dragon was aware of her as well. Most likely, it was hiding or guarding his treasure. Something shimmered in the gloom. Nora lit a candle and her eyes went wide. On the floor, dozens of round, teardrop-shaped, white pearl discs shimmered like abalone. These were scales, dragon scales. The energy and beautiful aura that it emitted was breathtaking. No doubt, the dragon had been using the sharp corners to shed its scales. She had heard stories, even read books of ice dragons, but she hadn't believed them. Or at least didn't think they still existed. She had flown through the snowy mountains and landed on the glaciers many times while patrolling northern Glendon. Nora chuckled softly. I'm being silly. It could just be a rare albino, she told herself. She had heard of those and even seen one before. It had been a nasty, moody creature that liked to steal everything. But it made sense. The people in Helvisti probably saw it as some sort of snow god and spoiled it rotten. Nora shook her head and slipped the scales into her pocket. Well, that's going to end, she declared. Once she was around the bend, the temperature in the room began to rise as she walked into the large steam-filled room and shook her head. At the center was a large, warm, mineral hot spring tapped directly from the mountain. On the far corner, to her right, she spotted the dragon's nest. Nora quickly recognized the ruined, musty bedding. It was filled with heaps of plunder and her beautiful, broken chandeliers. Now that she had found the nest, she knew the dragon had to be close by, and she didn't have time to admire the beautiful tile work in the dome ceiling above. Nora eyed the misty pool suspiciously. Sunlight streamed down from the oculus window and danced and twisted within the rising cloud of white mist coming from the natural mineral spring. Oh dear! I wonder where you could be hiding, Nora cooed in a patronizing sing-song voice. She knew exactly where the dragon was hiding. With poised anticipation, she summoned in a gust of warm air from behind her and swept away the thick veil of mist. Two big obsidian eyes gazed up at her from the calm water surface. Only its snout and shimmering white crown of horns poked out of the pool. Nora tilted her head. By the fully developed crown, she could tell there was a large, fully mature dragon waiting beneath the murky green mineral water. While she couldn't know for certain, by the soft ridges and a slimmer jawline and shy behavior, she most likely was dealing with a Hendrick. This, of course, didn't mean less dangerous. 
It just meant she could expect more passive aggression. Most males would have attempted to chase her out by now. But this dragon was patiently waiting to spring an ambush. Nora smiled. You are a very strange dragon, she teased, as she prepared an invisible barrier around herself. But she had to be careful. She could only maintain the protective ward for up to a minute without severe health risks. But she was fairly certain with the dragon's cagey body language, she was going to need it soon. The dragon stared back at her. Its pitch black eyes were wide and hyper vigilant. You have made a very big mess, Nora cooed. A dragon hissed at her agitatedly. Instead of backing away, Nora stepped toward the nest. The dragon attacked and let out a snarled yelp as it slammed its snout into the invisible barrier. If the dragon had been dealing with anyone else, it would have bitten their head off and tossed their mangled body about like a rag doll, without so much as a second thought. Nora smiled with satisfaction as she allowed the barrier to fall away. She couldn't hold it for long, and she didn't want to become overly fatigued. Oh my, what have you got piled up over there? Nora mused out loud. The dragon hissed, but the moment it could lunge at her again, she spun around and gave it a good rap on the snout with her staff. No, Nora commanded sternly. She didn't raise her voice. She wanted the dragon to get used to following commands without her shouting. Dragons had very good hearing, and she would only look like an absolute lunatic if she went about shouting at the poor thing all the time. The dragon quickly recoiled and slipped back into the pool, albeit the loud snarl and menacing open jaws show that this little feud between them was not over. Once again she spoke in a calm but stern voice. No, she commanded, knowing full well that the dragon would try to attack again. She gripped her staff and focused once more. Once the barrier was in place, she turned her back, daring the dragon to come at her again. However, instead of biting her like last time, she suddenly found herself completely and utterly engulfed in white mist. Nora gasped in shock as a thick dome of ice rapidly crystallized around her ward. The barrier had saved her from being turned into an ice sculpture, but now she was trapped. The dragon let out an excited, chortling growl as it came at her again. Two days to keep the barrier up, and unable to get away, Nora threw herself to the ground and held up her staff, ready to kill it if she had to. But the dragon was not able to break through. She could see the vivid silhouette of the rows of large, curved, dagger-like teeth scraping on the outer surface. Right then, she realized the dome of ice was too large for the dragon to wrap its jaws around, and all it could do was scratch and slobber. Once she realized she had time to recover, she suddenly became aware that the dragon had not breathed fire. Amazing, she marveled. This was absolutely amazing. All she had to do was break free and not die, and she might actually be able to tell somebody about it. Winter was a frost dragon. Yes, that was going to be her name until she could come up with something more original. Winter growled back at her, but before the dragon could climb out of the pool and crack open the ice bubble with its large talons, Nora set the top of her staff on the ceiling of the ice dome and quickly melted a small little hole on top. Knowing full well she would be killed the second she popped her head out, she sent a little grape-sized fireball floating up into the air. Winter eyed the little flame with suspicion and instinctively snapped at it. 
But the moment she did, there was a second and then a third circling around her head. The dragon growled angrily and snapped again and again until she became so frustrated that she forgot all about the mage in front of her. I said no, Nora shouted as she sprang free and walloped Winter over the snout for a second time. Winter yelped and Nora nodded in satisfaction. But it wasn't long before the disgruntled dragon began to size her up again. No, she repeated, this time in a softer, gentler voice. However, when she tried to move toward the dragon's nest, Winter let out a shrill howl, and this time she quickly swam over to the water's edge and blocked Nora's path, using her full body. As she fanned out her massive white velvet wings and raised up on her haunches to brandish claws and long, menacing whip-like tail. Those are my blankets and my chandeliers, Nora insisted. While both bedding and chandeliers were ruined, she was merely trying to prove a point. Winter lashed at the mage with her tail, but Nora calmly passed behind the large pillar, allowing the dragon's tail to glance off the marble. Nora continued to advance, and the dragon's nostrils flared. The moment the mage moved out into the open, Winter lashed out again. A wall of blue sparks sprayed up into the air as her tail connected with the invisible ward. Winter yelped as she recoiled her singed tail. Nora sighed. You're being difficult, she scolded. This was an understatement. Any other mage would have been forced to kill the poor Hendrake. Not many could outcast her. Well, there was one she knew of, Magi Hendrix. He was the head dueling mage at Founders. The man could vaporize two arrows in mid-flight. While Nora couldn't exactly communicate telepathically to dragons like Simmons could, she was quite capable of stating her intentions and understanding theirs. Like any other living creature, it was really about tone and body language. And right now, Winter was very, very upset and frightened. And by the way, the Hendrake was puffing out her chest and coiled back. She was gathering her strength for another frost attack. No, Nora whispered in a soft, stern warning. The dragon didn't listen. But this time, instead of staying on the defensive and getting stuck inside the ice ball again, Nora drew upon the plentiful heat rising from the mineral spring and struck back. A river of fire and frost clashed together. The dragon's roar was loud, long, and terrible. But Nora had the advantage. The dragon could only sustain what its massive lungs could spew. Finally, the dragon was forced to breathe, and when it did, it inhaled a mouthful of white steam that burnt her tongue and scalded her throat. Not badly, but enough to be very uncomfortable. Winter quickly recoiled and huddled its head down low, finally accepting defeat. His frightened, big black eyes gazed up at her. Nora set her staff down and panted softly. She was fatigued and drenched with sweat. But she wasn't about to show weakness now. When she tried to move forward, Winter used her large, shimmering, white scaly body to block her path. Albeit this time... Her posture remained low and submissive. It was clear the dragon had lost the will to fight, but Winter was still stubbornly trying to block the path to her nest full of treasured sparkles, even if only passively laying in front of it. Nora sighed and glared at the dragon, 
and impatiently tapped her foot. Winter's tail swiveled back around. Nora prepared to charge the energy field again, but instead of trying to take her head off, the dragon set a small, broken crystal fragment down at the mage's feet. While well, it was a mere fraction of the two massive crystal chandeliers piled up in her nest, it was still a nice gesture. Thank you, Winter. You are very generous, Nora praised her, but instead of picking up the crystal, she reached down and gently stroked the frost dragon's tender snout. Surprisingly, despite the wintry appearance, the frost dragon's soft nostrils were quite warm to the touch. For a moment, she shied away, but winter finally settled down and allowed Nora to continue to stroke her. Nora smiled when winter's big black eyes began to close. You aren't so mean, are you? Nora cooed softly. You like water. And all the stupid heads were giving you nasty dry ashes, weren't they? She whispered. She wasn't sure if Winter could understand, but the dragon responded with a low, rumbling whine that seemed to imply she was getting someplace. Well, I can't let you stay in here. You're making an awful mess, she mused out loud all the while speaking in a rhythmic sing-song voice. Are you hungry? Nora asked. There was no response. She tilted her head to the side. The dragon's eyes were shut, and long and deep rhythmic breaths echoed throughout the marble bathhouse. Fire dragons typically got rather sluggish and sleepy after breathing fire. It wasn't a pleasurable thing for them, and she could only imagine frost dragons might share some of the similarities. I will bring you back something nice, she promised in a soft whisper. Nora straightened up and let out a tired but contented sigh. Things had gone surprisingly well. So long as she didn't try to move the dragon from the hot springs, she and Winter would get along swimmingly. Now she had to crack some human heads and twist some arms to have the whole bloody damned mansion and the dragon stalls remodeled to accommodate a frost dragon. The bloody fools had no idea what they were dealing with. Admittedly, she had no idea either, but it was obvious Winter liked warm water. Supposedly, the Baru waste was full of mineral springs, she couldn't help but wonder how many more frost dragons could be out there. Everyone always looked in the mountains and cliffs for dragons, and she felt a little bit silly for even thinking of fire dragons as being normal. Even they were endangered and hard to find, but compared to winter, winter was truly one of a kind. She had never thought any creature could ever take Goldeneye's place. She knew Winter never would, but after meeting the Hendrake, she was already attached and very upset at how the poor dragon was being treated. Nora smiled as she exited the same way she had come. She was surprised how long she had been inside, it had felt like only a few hours, but the sun was already starting to go down, and there was still so much to do. Nora marched through the snow-filled courtyard, but right when she came to the main gate, her smile fell away. She couldn't wear this. She quickly turned back around and ran to her burnt-up yurt and began rummaging through her travel chest. Dealing with her new dragon was only half the battle. She hadn't packed any of her nice dresses. That entitled green-eyed toad, Irene, was probably rummaging through her closet right now. None of her dresses would fit her, of course. Irene was much shorter. This didn't help make Nora feel any better, as this meant Irene would have to cut them off at the knee to make them fit. 
Being so tall, it was nearly impossible to find clothes her size. It had also been the reason why she hadn't chosen her sword companion from the myriad of skilled young warriors at Founder's training yard. Despite being wonderful in almost every way, Vila was also just the right height to make her feel small. Small in a good way. His massive, tattooed arms could utterly engulf her. The very thought made her feel hot and feverish all over. She smiled when she realized Vila was aware of her excitement through the soul bond, and the hug she felt was much more than a fond memory. Nora spun around. She was so excited. The first thing she was going to buy was a horse, for now she would settle with her military dress uniform. That was one outfit she could not throw away or leave behind. Well, not without causing more trouble than it was worth. She grimaced. More green. But at least this fit. She stood a little taller as she fixed the twin silver nautical stars on her high collar that designated her as a mage. The northern point at the top was painted black and blue, indicating she was the member of Dragon Hall, and the west wing was painted maroon and turquoise, showing that she was an elemental mage as well. There, of course, were some special snowflakes, wizards like Irene, who did not come from founders, would only a blank silver star. Unless, of course, they were dragon riders. Torn and worn, both weren't mages, yet still were part of Dragon Hall, would merely wear black and blue rectangle bar that was bordered with bronze. The seven golden bands on Nora's sleeve signified her rank as a war mage. The rank below her was a battle mage, and the rank below a battle mage was a field mage, and so on and so on. Naturally, she never wore her dress uniforms out in the field, these were only used for formal occasions, or when she wanted to strut around and scare everyone half to death during inspections. Nora draped her heavy mage's cloak over her shoulders. Out of shame, she had left her dragon rider's cloak back in Glendon. For now, all she had was her elemental cloak, which was half a vibrant turquoise and dark maroon. It didn't go well with the green uniform, but it didn't matter. The moment any soldier saw the golden stripes on her sleeve, they would quickly find something very important to do. Dressing to impress, Nora went to her jewelry box and smiled as she fished out her favorite pearl earrings and then hesitated. Instead, she found the white dragon scales, and with a little bit of magic and some modification, she gently set aside the loose pearls and hung the dragon scales to her pierced ears. Nora smiled as she turned her head side to side. The scales shimmered like abalone. Don Rascal would not have approved of her wearing dragon scales, but Nora was planning on making the biggest scene imaginable, and she was going to look stunning while doing it. The dragon scales would serve as irrefutable proof that she had met Winter and wasn't merely throwing a tantrum. Naturally, she wanted her house back, but she couldn't move Winter without having some place suitable for housing a frost dragon. The first thing she needed was for another large pool to be dug inside the barn, and the natural hot water to be diverted so Winter could have a place to stay besides her mansion. Once the dragon had a nice place of her own, Nora could focus on flying. After she was finished looking herself over, Nora quickly bundled herself in a black silk robe, 
She couldn't go into the barn to get Simmons wearing her dress uniform. Prince would be all sorts of excited, and not in a good way. Once she was covered up in black, Nora marched toward the barn. She beamed happily as she spotted Simmons climbing down from the hayloft. You're awake, Nora exclaimed. Simmons nodded. It's almost dark, he lamented. But you were right. I needed the sleep. I feel a lot better. But I really should be getting back now. Wonderful. Do you think you can drop me off someplace on your way back by chance? She asked. Simmons held his belly and laughed. I know that smile. Whose head are you going to bite off? He asked. I am not going to bite anyone's head off. I am just going to have a talk with the mayor. It isn't far by dragon. It's only five minutes away. You could just drop me off and I'll handle the rest. She declared with a fiercely determined grin. All right, crazy eyes. Let me get Prince saddled up and ready to go, he chuckled. Simmons? Yes? Do I really have crazy eyes? Or are you just saying that, she asked weirdly. Vila had mentioned it once, but she had merely laughed. But now Simmons had brought it up as well. She fought the urge to run back to her yurt and check the mirror. Simmons smirked as he quickly secured the last trap to the saddle harness. No, no, of course not. I was just teasing, he assured her. Nora smiled and let out a sigh of relief. Are you ready to go? he asked. She quickly nodded and he guided her around back and made sure she was good and secure before getting on himself. Once they were out of the barn and under the open sky, Prince chirped excitedly and stretched out his wings. The little nap had done wonders, and he was ready to fly again. Nora had to hold tight onto Simmons as the dragon's powerful black wings sent them soaring right over the wall and up into the air. Nora looked back. Her poor little burnt-up yurt was now absolutely plastered with snow. But none of that mattered when she saw the city below. Right then, she knew she would triumph. She knew that she would fly again, and one day she might even redeem herself. Soon, her determined gaze settled upon the governor's estate below, and she watched with grim satisfaction as the servants went running and the guards held on to their helmets and stared up in dismay. Prince gracefully touched down, just long enough for Nora to hop off while everyone turned away from the swirling gale of wind and snow. Halt! Who goes there? called a reluctant guard. I am Nora Frey, she declared, and with a dramatic flourish, she unclasped her black covering and discarded it on the ground so that all would recognize her uniform. The moment she emerged from the swirling white flurries of snow, the guards immediately snapped to attention, and a servant rushed forward to gather up her discarded black cloak. Who is in charge here? she demanded. Sergeant Monty at your service, Magi, he saluted. <laughs> this, this is a very big surprise. We weren't expecting you. I'm so glad you're on our side. Does uh, Governor Von Claris know you're coming? he asked. Who is on watch? Nora demanded. I didn't even hear one alarm or any sound of warning as we approached. If I had been a rival drune mage, you would all be dead. Nora knew such an attack would never happen. According to Vila, the lands west of them were not controlled by the drune, and they didn't use magic, and if anything, they might even be considered natural allies against the drune, but it was the principle that truly mattered. 
Anything Sergeant Monty was going to say was going to be wrong. She would make certain of it. Sergeant Monty gulped. I, I, I will find out at once. You don't know, Nora snapped at him. There is so many high, high, disgraceful. You should all be publicly flogged. Sergeant Monty fell to his knees. Please, Magi, it's overcast. The clouds are low. If anyone should take punishment, it should be me. I instructed them to keep watch on the road. That is no necessary. Find those responsible and punish them, Nora commanded. But Sergeant Monte remained on his knees. I am responsible, Magi, he insisted. Nora hesitated and glanced back at him. Most would roll over on their belly, soil themselves, and sacrifice as many subordinates that it would take to appease her just so they could save their own miserable hides. Well, sometimes Nora felt a little guilty for kicking the regular enlisted soldiers around. She was always surprised to find a few beautiful souls who refused to back down. Strong men, hard men, who wouldn't sell out their subordinates no matter how much you twisted their arms and threatened them. Get on your feet and do as you're told, Nora snapped. Sergeant Monty refused to rise. Nora glanced about. Everyone silently watched. Some of them were even in tears. Nora felt as if she might cry herself, but she wasn't going to. Master Sergeant Monty, extend your hand, she commanded. Sergeant Monty hesitantly lifted his head, both perplexed by why she had called him by the wrong rank, and yet clearly too frightened to correct her. I am demoting you to staff sergeant, and I am reassigning you to be the head of security over my own mansion at Dragon Colony, she declared, and then firmly pressed a heavy gold coin into his gloved hand. Nora smiled as she watched the former Sergeant Monty try to do the math. She had promoted him two ranks and demoted him one. Staff Sergeant Monty stared up at her, his face suddenly alight. But, Magi, the mansion has been abandoned, and the dragon, he began. Nora Frey smiled as she bid him to rise to his feet. The dragon is now in good hands, and the mansion is being renovated. I trust you and your men will make certain no one will steal any building supplies, she declared. Staff Sergeant Monty blinked. When is this happening, he asked. I'm confident work will begin first thing tomorrow, she declared, with as much confidence as she could muster. Part of leadership and getting anything started was acting and believing it would be so. But what about Governor Von Claris? I just can't order everyone to leave now. Can I? I will see that the governor is informed, Nora assured him. It will be done as you say, Magi. Staff Sergeant Monty saluted. Nora nodded. And when she turned, she was buffeted by the sudden outburst of loud cheers as the guards and servants celebrated the newly promoted Staff Sergeant Monty. When she looked back, she smiled when she saw his men parading their fearless leader about the courtyard like a war hero. But she didn't linger. She had business to attend to, her long gold trim Overcoat glided behind her as she bounded up the stairs, and the servants beamed at her as they gave her the sweeping, glamorous double-door entrance that took both the butler and housekeepers by utter surprise as she came striding unannounced into the vibrant orange marble entry. 
"'What in the world is all the commotion going on outside?' exclaimed the butler. But the staff quickly gave him a bug-eyed stare and silently gestured over toward the war mage standing at the entry. The butler quickly straightened up, gave himself a quick pat down, fixed his black cuffs and white gloves before hesitantly approaching their unexpected but clearly very important guest. Oh my, forgive me, Magi. May I take your coat? he asked timidly. No, you can take me to Von Claris, she commanded. The butler swallowed hard as he quickly contemplated his options and offered a weak smile as he beckoned her to follow. Chapter 19 Governor Von Claris The governor's personal library was his most treasured possession. While the rest of the mansion sparkled with polished marble and gilded trim, this room was full of warmth, and the dark mahogany wood was saturated with the sweet smell of beeswax candles, paper, and aged leather. The cozy, circular room was packed from floor to ceiling with books at the center of the room. Was his large desk that was full of maps and a lot of other various oddities, a large hourglass and star charts. In the corner, there was a large telescope. Tonight, Claris was not at his work desk. He was in his regal navy blue silk robe, he was sitting in his large, cushioned, green leather chair. And he had his sandaled feet propped up onto a matching stool, warming his toes by the fireplace. Just as he reached over to find his reading spectacles, the door flew open. Uh, I'm terribly sorry to disturb you, sir, but there is someone to see you, the butler announced. Clarice grimaced as he rubbed the deep weathered lines in his forehead and reluctantly set his reading glasses back down on the little table beside him. He didn't bother to turn around or to get angry by the tone of his butler's voice. It was obviously someone he couldn't throw out. If that had been the case, he was quite certain James would have done so already, and filled him in all the lovely details at breakfast. Who is it, James? he asked hurriedly. Magi Frey, sir. She insists it's very important. Clarice perked up. Well, this was going to be interesting. Ah, smashing! Please send her in. James let out an audible gulp, and he nervously cleared his throat. Uh, sir, uh, she, um, she is here already. Pardon? Glarus asked as he glanced up toward James. James gestured toward the tall mage standing in the middle of the room. Clarice strained his neck as he twisted around in his chair and let out a surprised guffaw. Well, this is quite unusual and very exciting. You are very ambitious, I see, he chuckled. Welcome. Come, have a seat by the fire, he beckoned. Do you want any refreshments? I suppose you are here to uh, talk about your estate and the dragon, he surmised, and pointed to the stone chessboard on the table between them. <laughs> do, do you play? he ventured. Nora made her way over toward the second chair by the fireplace. She glanced disdainfully toward the chessboard. She hated chess. There were too many rules. Besides, she was not here to play games, at least not board games, and so she remained standing and fixed her best and meanest glare down onto the governor. 
How long have you had this frost dragon? She demanded. Claire smiled a smug smile as he scooped up a cracker and slice of cheese from the silver snack tray beside him and took his time chewing before he answered. Mm. Excellent! So you have met the dragon called Helvisti. I trust things are going well? He remarked as he reached over to the snack tray. Nor as the nostrils flared. His name is Winter, and you didn't answer my question. How long have you had this frost dragon, she demanded. Claris turned his head to the side as he thoughtfully stroked his large, bristly, white mustache, causing little crumbs to fall down his robe. Oh, I would say well over twenty years. We brought her in as a little fledgling. She was becoming quite the nuisance, but the tribespeople revere her as a physical incarnation of Helvesi. So you can say we've sort of had her around for a while, but as you can imagine, as the dragon has grown, she has become very hard to manage. Nora was dumbfounded. Let me get this straight. You've had a frost dragon for twenty years, and you haven't even bothered to tell anyone, she demanded. Claris smiled and put his hand up so he could finish chewing. Mm. Oh, alas, I'm sorry to say that Helvisti is a perfectly normal, yet still very beautiful albino Hendrake, he informed her, and then quickly brushed the crumbs from his hands before making another broad sweeping gesture. I have a whole shelf of books devoted to dragons, and I at one time had hoped and thought the same as you, but alas, I fear frost dragons are somewhat of, of a myth, and if they did exist like the legends, well, they do not exist anymore. Nora pressed her fingertips together and took in a deep, serene, calming breath. Oh, I see. Well, I am terribly sorry for bothering you. I had no idea. May I borrow a few of your books? Claris gave a sympathetic nod. Perfectly all right. I am happy you stopped by and... And don't feel bad. When I was a young whippersnapper, I climbed all those snowy mountains and searched the caves, hoping to find one. I even picked up a piece of obsidian from the foot of Helvisti's blessed mountain, he encouraged, and turned toward his butler. Um, James, please find the memoirs of Amender Farinke and the search for the mythical frost dragons of the north, he instructed. James bowed and quickly pulled out a large blue book with worn gold trim edges and presented it to Nora. Nora gratefully accepted the beautiful book with an appreciative smile. Claris nodded in approval. I think you will like it very much. Please come visit again. I will let you borrow another. But when he looked down at his plate of cheese and crackers, James let out a shrill, strangled wail of protest. Ah, that book is priceless, the butler shrieked. Claris turned. His eyes went wide in horror as James had bodily placed himself in front of the hungry, crackling yellow flames of the fireplace and the mage. The cheese and crackers went flying as he frankly shot to his feet. Oh, what are you doing? He gasped. Nora could have easily used magic to burn the book or push the butler out of the way. But after a brief struggle, she allowed the frantic butler to wrestle the book away. Inwardly, she was rather quite glad. She didn't really want to burn the book. She was just out to make a point and to get the governor's attention. And it had worked quite well. Claris was beat red and quivering with rage. How 
dare you, he began. How dare you, Nora snapped back and poked him hard in the chest until he flopped back down into his chair. How dare you, he roared from his chair. Nora thundered back, her face going red and veins flaring from her neck as she raged. How dare you keep my poor dragon in such wretched conditions? Do you have any idea how much that poor creature has suffered? You will never be elected again after the people of Helvisti have seen what you have done to my dragon. The blustering Von Claris wilted in his chair. That, that, that can't be possible. I put General Gordon in charge of its care. He assured me that he had everything under control and that he was going to bring in an expert he countered. I am the expert, and I am appalled at the conditions General Gordon and his cronies have kept that poor creature in. Winter has been absolutely miserable and wretched, Nora shouted down at him. Governor Von Claris slammed his palms down onto the sides of his chair. Dear gods, you're, you're absolutely right. Why, in sweet Helvisti's name, didn't you come to me sooner, he demanded. Nora nodded, but before she could respond, he thrust his thick, stubby finger into the air and shot to his feet. This is outrageous. James, bring me my winter coat and shoes, he commanded, and he turned to Nora. I am so glad you have come to me. General Gordon will be held fully responsible for this gross negligence, he vowed. I would be eternally grateful if you could spare some of your staff. The whole estate is an utter ruin and disrepair. I've been left without security. I don't want people snooping around or interfering with Winter's training, especially after the horrible abuse she has suffered. I'm afraid of what may happen if any children were to sneak in. Dear gods, of course, absolutely, Von Claris assured her. Nora blinked rapidly, forcing several tears out. May have Visti bless you, she sniffled. The governor quickly rushed to her side and gently patted her hand in his. My dear, you must be so overwhelmed. He comforted her and quickly passed over a clean black silk handkerchief from his top pocket. I just hate to see such a... Poor, beautiful dragon suffer so, Dora gasped breathlessly. She was really working it up now. It's been living in its own filth for weeks, and I have no place to put her. The whole place is in ruin, and the barn is a horrid rat's nest, and is about to collapse, and General Gordon... Send all my engineers to help back Glendon. I haven't anyone to help me. Oh, that's absolutely dreadful. There, there, my dear. I, I had no idea. Please don't cry, Clarice gasped. Nora allowed herself to be guided over to the large comfy chair. I'm so sorry I shouted at you. I was so upset. My... Hut burned down, and my poor dragon is in terrible condition, she sniffled. It burned down? How did that happen, he gasped. Nora hesitated. Cooking fire? I've been living on gruel since I've been here, and General Gordon said if I complained, he would have me flogged, and you are the only one left I have to turn to, she blubbered. So, you have been staying in a little hut all this time in the middle of winter, Clarice gasped. Nor nodded. Not for long. You will stay in the guest house adjacent to mine until this injustice is made right, he vowed. As he slipped into his heavy bearskin fur coat, rest, my dear. James will take care of you. While I go pay General Samoth Gordon a visit, he declared. I'll go with you, Nora volunteered. Nonsense! 
Your job is to take care of the spirit of Helvisti. My job is to deal with everybody else. James glanced wordily back over toward the beautiful books and turned toward Nora. Shall I show you to the guest house, Magi? he offered in a overly hopeful voice. You are so very sweet, James. Yes, thank you, she agreed. James smiled and quickly hurried over to her, making certain to place himself between the wall of books and the psychotic firebug to his right. I shall get some of the female staff to see that you are settled in and comfortable, he assured her. That is very chivalrous of you. If I didn't have Vila, you would make a wonderful sword companion, she praised him. James perked up and stood a little taller. Oh, no, Magi, I wouldn't know what to do with a sword, he laughed. You seem quite fit. Do you have any other skills? Can you draw maps, she asked. James shook his head. Well, I did a lot of swimming before this job. I used to go diving for oysters, he said proudly. You certainly seem to know your way around this library. I imagine you're quite educated, she remarked. I really wish they would change the name Sword Companion. It is so misleading, as they hardly ever need to use a sword unless their mage is trying to keep a low profile or injured, she sighed. James grimaced. Not really. I know how to read, write, and do mass, but I'm not formally educated. I just read a lot, that's all. That is one of the things I like about my job, he chuckled. Don't sell yourself short. Not everyone can do those things. Have you ever been to Glendon before, she asked. James smiled. I have seen pictures and read about it. It sounds wonderful. Nora smiled. You should see the size of the library at Founders. James bit his lower lip, and a hard line formed on his forehead. I heard that's only for mages. I wouldn't be allowed in, he lamented. The librarians have sword companions as well, Nora pointed out. James blinked. Well, I suppose they had to keep the book safe, he remarked. Nora felt a stab of guilt for the little stun she had pulled, which involved threatening to burn the library book. Well, they do more than sort books. You see, librarians also organize search parties and look for things. Lost things, old things, relics, ancient cities, fossils, and different medicinal plants they find in old texts. And sometimes they journey thousands of miles and take their sword companions with them. It could be quite interesting. James was silent for several long moments. Their footsteps echoed loudly as they continued to walk through the marble halls. Do you think I could really be a sword companion, he asked. Nora laughed. That isn't up to me, but I think you would be... Pleasantly surprised and very happy with the generous salary you would receive from founders if you completed your training and were selected, she assured him. Chapter 20 Daydreams and Nightmares May didn't remember falling asleep, but when she awoke she was startled at how warm she was, and when her eyes fluttered open she found herself sandwiched between soft black velvet and smooth scales. Raven? she squeaked in fright. The dragon pulled back his massive wings, and she winced as bright rays of light beamed down onto her from over the berm of the ash circle. Raven craned his long neck, tilted his head to the side, and glanced down at her with his big, shimmering, liquid silver eyes, as if she was some sort of hatchling fresh from the egg. Hey! May exclaimed. 
While she had been sleeping, Raven had plucked her up and placed her into his nest without her permission. The large bull drake merely snorted at the noisy creature's ingratitude. With nimble dexterity, the dragon used his tail to pick her up and drop her on top of the outer rim of the ashen mound. You could have squished me, she exclaimed. Raven chortled at the thought as he slowly unraveled himself, rose to his feet, and lazily meandered toward the landing bridge. The dragon flexed his wings to their zenith, reared up onto his hind legs and gauged the wind as he took in the morning smells. May chased after him. Raven, I'm sorry, you don't have to leave, she exclaimed. The lithy, armored, plated swan-like neck pivoted around and the big, daunting black face with the bristly crown of black horns peeked under its wing. May suddenly got a vision of a large tree stump he found floating out in the ocean. This vision was placed next to the crude form of her brush. To him, it was just a little twig. Therefore, he would replace it with a bigger one, and then she would be happy. And if she wasn't happy, she would be more than compensated. But I don't want a big log. What am I going to do with it? She demanded. Raven tilted his head. May frowned. She got the vision of herself gnawing on it. No, I don't like sticks. Raven blinked. He was clearly puzzled as to why she had even made such a big fuss over him eating the stupid brush to begin with. This seemed to perk up the dragon's interest as he swiveled his head around and self-consciously glanced about his scaly chest and then back at her. A strange guttural, fluted whistle rumbled deep from within his chest, resonated through his long neck and rolled off his blue tongue. Nope. Not until you take me flying, May insisted. Raven's demeanor soured and his big eyes narrowed. He would not let the silly little creature ride on top of him. May stuck out her tongue, folded her arms, and with a very dissatisfied harumph, turned away. Raven snorted and stubbornly fixed his gaze onto the horizon, his front right paw rasped against the stones and stamped down hard. May mimicked him and stamped her foot down as well. The dragon blinked and crooked his head, trying to look at her. May stubbornly whipped her head around, refusing to look at him. Raven chortled in amusement. May let out a frustrated sigh, albeit when she was about to give up and go back inside and fix some breakfast, the same sneaky, powerful, dexterous tail that had pulled her into the nest while she was asleep coiled around her ankles. May screamed as she desperately grasped at the smooth stone tiles, as she screamed until Founder's Keep turned into a tiny speck below, and she screamed until there was no more air to scream. After the initial shock wore off, she helplessly glanced about as she bounced along the big, fluffy white clouds. They flew higher and higher until they sailed past the sun and the moon. May gasped in wonder as the bright stars began to dance and to sing all around her in a beautiful chorus, which didn't make any sense at all, but it didn't have to because it was all a dream. Irene gently shook her awake. When May's eyes fluttered open, she glanced about, disappointed to find that she was still curled up right where she had been, and Raven was still dozing inside his nest. Irene smiled. How are you? she whispered. May squinted her eyes and let out a long, heavy sigh. I was dreaming, she mumbled. Irene smiled again. Come. There is a lot to be done, she encouraged in a low whisper. What are we doing? May yawned. You are going to bond with him, Irene declared. 
Sort of like a magi would with her sword companion, she explained. May's eyes widened. I didn't know you were a mage, she marveled. Irene smiled and lightly touched May's little nose. Do you think everyone goes to Founder's Keep to learn magic, she asked. May might have nodded, but the amused tone in Irene's voice indicated that was clearly the wrong answer. You are. She was about to say something rude, but Irene's sharp green eyes narrowed, and she quickly bridled her tongue before she said something foolish and hated herself forever. Do you have a sword companion? May asked in a low voice. I have my dragon, she replied as she pulled out eight small clay bowls from her satchel. May suddenly felt giddy and excited. But will you ever pick one? she ventured. To her surprise, Irene's jade-green eyes wandered, and a soft smile formed on her lips. Perhaps, Irene replied dismissively, and then directed May to set the clay bowls around the raven's nest, and to alter each with a bit of sage in one and incense in the other. Once she was finished, May came scurrying back. Who is it? she pried. Irene quirked. A dark, stern brow. May gulped. It was then a very tired and cranky Cora hissed impatiently at them through the hole in the wall. I need you two ninnies to focus. Can you do that? She scolded them. May gasped. She was stunned that Cora had stayed awake all night to watch over them, and she eagerly bobbed her head up and down. What is... The sage and incense for? I have never heard about this in the Founder's Keep, she asked in a low whisper. Irene struck a match and lit a candle. The smoke from the burning sage and incense keeps dragons docile, sort of like smoke for bees, she explained, and motion made to quietly light the incense and the sage. After this, you'll be entirely on your own, Irene warned. May accepted the candle and bit her lower lip. She looked toward Irene weirdly. Irene nodded toward Raven, giving her an impatient jade-green glower that sent her on her way. Her heart pounded inside her as she painstakingly moved from sage to incense, sage to incense, guarding the little flame until all eight bowls were lit and the rich, sweet gray tendrils of smoke wafted into the air, filling the lobby. Once she was finished, May glanced back over toward Irene, but Irene didn't so much as blink. She just stared back with her usual disturbingly observant, calm green eyes and waited, taking a deep, calming breath. May turned and knelt down on the ashen mound and fixed her attention on Raven's big thorny head. One wrong move and the dragon could quite easily fit her in his mouth and chomp her in half. Despite the danger, she couldn't help but admire the thorny black barbs growing under his chin. They weren't very big, but none of the other dragons that she had seen up close had them, not even Rex. May closed her eyes. She needed her full concentration. The only time she had ever soul-bonded any other living creature was at Founder's Keep. It had been the final assignment. It wasn't exactly as exciting or scary as it sounded, and she really couldn't compare the two at all. A poor little fruit fly in a jar was nothing compared to a dragon like Raven. As would be expected, the fruit fly didn't live long, and some of the girls even cried. One mender managed to resurrect the poor bug for two weeks, until finally she gave it a proper burial in the garden. Tesley was her name. She was a talented mender, but not exactly right in the head. She had nearly caught the whole girl's dormitory on fire for a silly spider. After that, Tesley had been moved to the specially gifted dormitory, which was made out of brick.
and a long way from everyone else. May had been sad when her pet fly had died. She hadn't been distraught. She understood that it was just a fly whose entire life lasted only a day. But it, it wasn't a pleasant feeling. She could feel it age, wither away within the hours, until finally she couldn't take it anymore, and she finally put the little bug out of its misery. She knew the whole exercise was to teach them that bonding with another creature was a very serious ordeal, and the little fruit fly in the jar would be nothing at all like a human, or a dragon for that matter. Mages often went raving mad when their sword companion died, and their guardians didn't fare much better. May remembered Toma, the old white-haired woman who haunted the library. She had lost her guardian ages ago, and she still talked to him, even though he wasn't there. Nobody bothered poor old Magi Toma. She had a whole stack of books and charts from her library in her room, but not even the head librarian ever bothered to, to ask for them back. Once again, May cleared her thoughts and opened her mind and searched for Raven. She sensed him, and she smiled. In her mind's eye, in her head, she saw two surprised big silver eyes flutter open. May felt her heart skip a beat as the dragon didn't seem at all a bit scared or angry at her. Raven was more curious. What was this silly creature doing inside his head, inside his dreams? Hello, I'm May, she whispered as she reached out and gently stroked his snout. Raven's eyelids drooped as he yielded to her caress. I like you. Do you like me? May asked. Raven let out a soft, fluted, thrumming sound. I wish you could stay forever, she whispered to him. She sent him images of endless heaps of ash for him to bathe and roll around in, of his scales being polished every day until they glowed like gems, and all the wild adventures they would have soaring through the air together. She sensed Raven yearning. She saw the eagerness in his silver eyes. But there was an awful deep ache and a sadness in them. And then something, something strange happened that she hadn't ever experienced or heard of before. The slimy, dark, leech-like creature wriggled from Raven's nostrils. Irene grabbed May by the shoulder. In an instant, May was jolted back into the real world. Her eyes fluttered open. Cora called out to them. Both of you get out now, she commanded. No, wait, I can save him, May shrieked. But when she turned back, Raven's eyes had turned into deep, inky, black obsidian pools. May tried to reach out to him, to speak to him, but Raven, her Raven was gone. Cruel laughter in black smoke billowed out of the dragon's jaws. Run! Irene screamed. Cora watched helplessly as May turned and fled, but before she could get to the door, both young women were engulfed in flames. Tears ran down her face, and her voice grew hoarse as she shouted, Loose! Bring it down! Bring it down! At once, a storm of crossbow bolts and javelins rained down from the ceiling. The dragon answered back with fire. The upper rooms were flooded with flames and horrible screams. The recruits fled away, burning as they ran. Cora cursed bitterly as she took up a spear. But just as she was about to go out, a fuzzy-headed recruit barreled past her. It was Brumir. She recognized him, being carried on the stretcher from last night. Idiot! She cursed, and she followed after him. But there was no calling him back. Brumir stood upright, out in the open, and he took aim. 
The entire room shook as the great bulldrake roared and reeled back as the crossbow bolt buried itself into its eye socket. Irene, Irene, May sobbed. Cora turned somehow, some way. May had not been harmed, but Irene, poor Irene, whom I dove on top of her to shield May with her magic, lay limp and unconscious, perhaps even dead. The gods only knew what it had cost her to shield May. Son of Maltine, Cora shrieked as she ran over toward the stone-faced Brumir, who was now winding up his crossbow. Cora grabbed him by his dirty gray tunic. Help me get them out of here, she commanded. Brumir turned, and the moment he saw Irene, he scooped her up into his arms and followed Cora out of the kill zone and set her down by the steps. Once back inside, Cora gave May a quick look over. Irene, Irene, I can't hear her thoughts, May shrieked. She's fine. She's just sleeping, Cora lied. How are you? Are you hurt? she asked. May shook her head. It wasn't him. It wasn't Raven. Please don't kill him. It's not him, she pleaded. Nora leaned forward, giving the hysterical young girl a kiss on the forehead. Sleep, she whispered. And May's eyes rolled to the back of her head. With a great care, Cora eased her gently to the floor and then turned her attentions back over toward Irene and then Brumir. Brumir stared up at her. Cora felt a lump in her throat. She's fine. She's going to be fine, she assured him. Do you know the way to Mender's Hall? Of course he did, but she needed him to focus. Brumir nodded and was about to kneel down to pick up Irene, but Cora stopped him. No, she's fine, understand? Cora insisted firmly. Tears ran down Brumir's ashen face. Take this. Run to Mender's Hall. Show him this. Bring them here. Tell them Cora sent you. And if they won't come, I need you to take charge and bring the wounded to them. Can you do that? Brumir nodded. Cora smiled and squeezed his hand. You have done well. Now go. I will finish this, she assured him. While upstairs was an absolute hellscape of charred bodies and horrible screams, Torn and his recruits down below had just managed to clear out the holes that had been clogged full of ash that prevented them from attacking the dragon's soft underbelly with their spears and heavy, powered crossbows. But the moment they had an opening, they unleashed hell until the dragon's blood and gore came pouring through the murder holes. Is it dead yet? Torrin called. Cora grimly strode forward with her spear in hand. The dragon lay on the ground, twisting and churning. She thrust her weapon into its remaining eye socket until the tip of the spear exited out the back of the dragon's skull. It's dead, she called back. But we have a lot of casualties up top, she added. Did you see what went wrong? Torn called up. Cora leaned against her staff and glanced down at Torn through the hole in the floor, and she shook her head. It was then she heard the haunted sound of alarm bells tolling off the distance. At that moment, she knew that what Torn had been warning everyone about had come true. And while they had been hunkered down, the Druin had found their opening. And Glendon, Marne's capital city and trade hub, was under attack. Just when she thought things couldn't get any worse, several dark silhouettes of armed soldiers crested the landing bridge. There was a band of elite Druin raiders, and judging by what had happened with the dragon, there was most likely one or several other mages amongst them. Torin, Cora called. A fire blossomed from the palms of her hand. What? You were right. 
elemental flames lapped at her fingertips as Cora grimly strode out to meet the enemy. What do we do? Milo exclaimed in panic. Torrin cursed. You two chatterheads, come with me. The rest of you ugly sons of Maltine, go up top and clean any of the scraps of Droon Cora leaves behind. Stay together. Don't die or I'll kill you again, he barked. Where are we going? Ben exclaimed. We're going to war, Torn growled, and he pointed his gnarled fingers toward the bundle of heavy ballista bolts. Grab as many as you can carry and follow me, he commanded, as he swung a heavy ballista bolt over one shoulder and the platform under his other arm. Meanwhile, up top, six other mass figures in all black crested the ledge, but the moment they became aware of Korra, they froze in their tracks. As they were still in the process of pulling their weapons from the longboats below, Do you want to jump before you're on fire? Or after? Korra inquired. One man drew his dagger, but with a wave of her hand, she set him ablaze. The droon soldier wailed and shrieked wretchedly as he ran about, and his flesh sizzled and his eyes melted into his skull, until he blindly ran for the ledge, but only prolonged his suffering as he only succeeded in running in tight little circles. Altogether, the rest threw themselves off the stone bridge, and those that weren't crushed on the rocks below swam to their boats. Cora took grim satisfaction as she watched them shriek and writhe as one by one she set their boats and supplies ablaze, forcing whatever survivors that remained to swim, or at least try to swim. The current was strong, and their warships were too far away. Cora grimly used the butt end of her spear to shove the dead, blackened, crispy droon off the bridge, and she strode over to the ledge, her eyes scanning for the mages responsible for killing so many of the young recruits. And Irene. Poor Irene. But as hard as she looked, she didn't see them. They had to be extremely powerful necromancers to control the bull drake from that far away. It had been a trap all along. The droon necromancers had let the dreadful creature loose to hunt them down, like a falconer loosing its falcons to hunt them like quail. Cora suspected they had control of the bull drake for months, perhaps even years prior to the attack. That was why May could not bond with it. The poor creature had been bonded already. These same necromancers had killed it too, hollowed it out like parasites killing their host before May could save him. There was nothing else Cora could do. She turned. She watched helplessly as smoke rose from the city. The droon had brought more dragons, and they were wreaking havoc. She wanted to go fly out and assist Torn, but she knew better. If she did that, the back door to Founder's Keep would be open and exposed. Even if twenty droon managed to take Dragon Hall alone, it would take hundreds of lives, perhaps even years, to push them back out again. That wasn't counting the dragons that would either be killed, stolen, or both. That was why the Droon had only sent a handful of elite soldiers to climb the cliffs. If they had succeeded in their plan, it wouldn't have been nearly impossible to take back the stronghold. If they failed... The casualties were relatively low. Yes, a droon might have lost their bulldrake, but it still opened a vital gap, leaving them exposed and vulnerable. And Dragonhall had lost three 
They're invaluable members to their team. Don Raskel, Nora Frey, Irene Rivers. Cora winced as she mentally counted the casualties that she knew about. She dreaded what she would find up top. Adar Solston had been upstairs, and he had not called back down yet. Adar was a fellow mage, and he was always full of random quotes, and his room was full of books. Everyone teased him that they were purely for decoration. He had specialized in weather magic. Naturally, he and Torn did not get along. Cora had to insist that they be on separate levels. Torn, initially, thought Edar had gotten the best view because he had been a fellow mage, but Cora managed to convince him that if things did go horribly wrong, he would get a better target at the dragon's soft underparts, and if things went well, he would be closer to the wine cellar. Cora smiled. She was quite certain Adar was all right. He was probably busy tending to the wounded. He probably needed help. The moment Cora turned and went back inside, her nostrils were seared with the acrid smell of burnt flesh. The stone corridors echoed with shrill screams and whimpers as, one by one, the horribly maimed and wounded were taken out on stretchers. So many burns. So many awful burns. Finally, once the wounded were cleared out, Dragon Hall became eerily quiet. The only noises were the muffled sobs of the living bringing out the charred remains of the dead. Cora watched helplessly. She turned to Irene. Her face was pale. Like her life had completely drained from her. Determined to set an example to the rest of the recruits, Cora could not let herself weep. With as much serenity as she could muster, she knelt down and gently closed Irene's eyelids. Sleep well, she whispered. Irene's long black eyelashes fluttered back open, and green eyes stared up at her. Cora gasped and recoiled her hand. This was not Cora's first dead body. Dead bodies did strange things. They twitched and made strange noises as they decomposed, and they stared up at you. To be absolutely certain... Cora's trembling fingers gently stroked Irene's ice-cold cheek, and then, then she felt the faintest cool trickle of air coming from her nostrils. She wasn't dead. Irene wasn't dead. Not yet, anyway. Oh, gods! Cora gasped as she stroked her cold, clammy forehead. With a glimmer of hope, she rose to her feet. Hadar! Hater, I need your help. Where is Magi Solston? She exclaimed. Cora knew he was obviously busy. He was naturally dealing with heavy losses. But the dead could wait. Irene was alive. She had to get Irene to Mender's Hall immediately. She spotted Brumir. She could always spot Brumir from the crowd of his fuzzy heads. He was quite large compared to everyone else. Brumir's face was red and sweaty from helping carry the, the dozens of stretchers down the stone stairway. Judging by what little of the shriveled blackened remains she could see beneath the blanket, they clearly were not in a hurry to get to Mender's Hall. She ran to him. Where is Magi Hadar Stolston? Have you seen him? she demanded. Brumir? and the other bald-headed recruits stared at her with blank faces and haunted eyes. Cora's heart dropped like a rock as they lowered the stretcher. Gone was the distinguished, peppered gray beard. Gone were the hazel eyes and the quiet smile. All gone. Just 
the blackened meat and shriveled sinew clinging to charred bone remained. The young, fuzzy-headed recruit stared up at her. Cora swallowed hard. She forced herself to think this could have been anyone. And then she glanced down at the charred soles of the leather riding boots as she turned toward Brumir and numbly accepted her ring back. I'm so sorry, Magi. They wouldn't come. I showed them the, your, your ring, and I begged them, but they wouldn't come. Brumir apologized. I need you to bring another stretcher, Kor insisted. But, Magi, there isn't any. The other recruits responded. Kor shuddered. She knew what needed to be done. She knelt. Her hands trembled as she grasped the sheet and pulled it over Adar's head. Rest in peace, dear friend, she whispered as she gently rolled the disturbingly light, charred remains of him onto his side and pulled the stretcher out from beneath him. Brumir, you've done so much. I only ask this one thing of you. Get Irene to Mender's Hall, she instructed. But what about May? Brumir asked. She is resting, Cora assured him. But you, he began. Irene is dying. Move quickly, she snapped at him. As commanded, they hustled away, leaving Cora kneeling by Adar. She wanted to go out and fight, but who else was left? Cora had to stay. She was the only one whom the dragons knew and would follow if Glendon fell. The rest was all out of her hands. It was all up to what was left of Glendon's decimated fleet and their regular army. Of course, the field mages of Founders and Torrin. Torrin would be out there flying into hell alone. Pride, selfish pride, told him she should be out there with him to fight and die with him. But if they could not stop them, nothing would, and the only right and most useful thing she could do was instruct the recruits to hold out as long as possible so she could get their dragons to safety. She would tell the young recruits she would bring back help. This would be a lie, but the Droon would not take the dragons. Without the dragons, all of Marn would fall. But if she could save them, perhaps one day, perhaps even in a few years, she would see Glendon liberated again. Cora closed her eyes and whispered a silent prayer. Spriga, grant us mercy. Varus, god of war, give us the strength to prevail. My name is Marco, and I am the author, narrator, and the glee man for Founders Keep. Uh, I wrote this during the lockdowns. And it is an audiobook for free on my YouTube channel at Dragon Audiobooks if you want to read along. And if you absolutely love the book, uh, you can get the, the hard copy and you can get it in digital. The cool thing about this book is that you can share it with your friends. And, um, you know, you know J.R. Tolkien, would you like to write him? You can't. He's gone. J.K. Rowling? You probably could messenger. She's a busy lady. She might get back to you. But me? I am here to entertain you. I am not just a writer. I am a glee man, if you will. And I do podcasts. I do audiobooks. So not only will you get this audiobook, you'll get all the other stuff that I put out on, on YouTube. And, um, and the most important thing, 
A sword. The most important thing. There will be dragons. There will be lots of dragons. And most fantasy books, dragons are gone extinct and they're gone. These dragons are very much here and real. So there will be dragons. Uh, fantasy, so Founders Keeps, fantasy fiction, uh, magic, mages, swords, true love, revenge. Dragon Audiobooks. Uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, Dragon Audiobooks, YouTube.